Your brain called and asked me to do a video on the health benefits of magic mushrooms. Yes, we are talking about the Gandalf of the fungi kingdom and how these boomer buttons are emerging as potential treatments for everything from treatment resistant depression to chronic pain. And we've probably only scratched the surface, but there's a lot to unpack here. So take a trip with me. Is it fungi or fungi? Is it, is it fungi or fungi? Fungi. Fungi? 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 Let's, let's go with fungi. It's what it is, right? It's fun guys. Fun little guys. Not that I would know. It seems that lately all of the drugs that I grew up with understanding were illegal or dangerous are now coming full circle. And as I mentioned in the ketamine video, they're being heavily researched for uses that look well beyond the scope of recreational or limited medicinal use. So this is generally a good thing. And in this case, it's a really good thing because science is quickly discovering that some of these drugs have extremely beneficial effects, more than we ever imagined. What's also ironic is that pretty much every drug you can think of has its origin in a natural substance. Opioids are from the poppy flower. Digoxin, which is a life-saving cardiac drug, is derived from the foxglove plant. Penicillin is from mold, as we know. The list goes on and on. Big Pharma is smart, and I always notice that while the FDA and law enforcement will heavily monitor and war against illegal drugs somewhere behind closed and deadbolted lab doors, you can bet that that substance is being studied and refined to see whether there are truly benevolent uses for it or if by synthesizing it, they can market it as the next big weight loss drug or life-saving medication and charge a buttload of money for it, if that's the case, and all, all the better, right? And case in point is the one that we're talking about in this video. Approximately 75% of polypore fungi have shown strong antimicrobial, antiviral, cardiovascular, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer activities. It's just, they're, they're incredible. Their uses are, we're just scratching the surface. As I said, it's vast and we are discovering more every day. And psilocybin isn't only found in one type of mushroom. It's actually produced in more than 200 species of mushrooms, some more potent than others. Psychedelics are a class of hallucinogenic drugs or hallucinogens that produce mind altering and reality distorting effects. Hallucinations typically trigger delusions, emotional swings, feelings of detachment and derealization and are generally classified into two categories. One is dissociative drugs such as dexamethorphan, which is a cough suppressant, also ketamine and phencyclidine, which are used in anesthesia. And the second are hallucinogens that interact with serotonin and dopamine receptors. Now, the extract has been around for millennia and was historically used as a psychedelic agent for religious and spiritual ceremonies, much like ayahuasca is today in South America. Then, as I mentioned earlier, Pharma began researching its potential, and in 1960, Indecibid was released on the market, but only made it about six years before, shocker, it was banned for abuse. That's unfortunate. And at that point, it really went downhill and became largely associated with the hippie counterculture movement, which in turn resulted in a growing and still lingering negative stigmatization for psychedelics in general. As a result, in 1970, Congress created an act which classified drugs based on their potential for abuse, the accepted medical use, and the safety of the drug while under medical supervision, and designated all psychedelics as Schedule I drugs, which had the distinction of a high potential for abuse. 
ultimately squashing any significant scientific study on them. So since research was then pretty much prohibited, it significantly delayed advances in our medical understanding of the therapeutic uses of agents like psilocybin. All was not lost though, and with the 90s came a renewed interest in its potential for aiding those suffering from depression, anxiety, and alcohol dependence. Very much the same path that ketamine took. And ketamine went on a wild ride to get where it is today. Where it started and where it wound up in its current applications is better than anything you'll watch on Netflix. So check that out next. Anyway, several small studies began collecting data on people who were given microdoses of psilocybin, and the results were extraordinary. Over time, even though these studies were small, the data continued to accumulate and caught the attention of Big Pharma once again. Mavericks re-engaging, sir. Who then looked to re-engage in the research and development of the drug for expanded medical purposes. So what do we do? What do we do with all, all of this? Where are we currently with our understanding of how this compound may benefit us? And what conditions are the effects of psilocybin being looked at in terms of emerging treatments? Therapeutic potential number one is depression, anxiety, and PTSD. All right, so this first indication is one that many are probably most familiar with. There's been a ton of buzz around self-directed microdosing, and it's shown a lot of promise. All of the information from those small studies that we talked about earlier have really stacked up in terms of building a really nice, robust trail of efficacy for psilocybin's use in treating mental health conditions. So much so that the FDA granted something called a breakthrough therapy designation. And what this means is a faster track for research and drug development is now permitted. However, this doesn't mean that come tomorrow, you'll turn your TV on and see a commercial for the latest psilocybin-based pharma drug. It's still going to take a while. And to give you some context, on average, it takes around 10 years for a drug to go from phase one clinical trials, which evaluates the safety dosage range and side effects and things like that, to FDA approval. So it takes, 10 years from the beginning of phase one clinical trials to FDA approval. It's a long time. In 2018, this fast track pipeline was granted to Compass Pathways for treatment resistant depression using a range of doses. Now, the results of the efficacy portion of the trial are complete. However, the safety aspects are still being carefully looked at and I will link all of my research in the description below for any of you who want to read about it. Two phase three trials for single dose and repeat dose regimens for treatment resistant depression have commenced and those studies are due out this coming summer in 2024 and mid 2025. And of course, they follow the positive phase two trial results. In 2019, the same designation was granted to the USONA Institute to treat regular depression using a single dose only. And the phase two trial results are now available on their website as well. And they show incredible promise again. I mean, just wow. Like, talk about limitless. You know, we've come so far in the treatment of depression. In some cases, we've gone too fast in the prevention of other illnesses, in my opinion, but that is that is a whole other video. Now, a note of caution, psilocybin is being looked at for the treatment of what's called unipolar depression. However, we know there are varying degrees to this and depression occurring within bipolar disorder adds a whole layer of complexity and unknowns and in this case, we don't know whether it could potentially trigger manic episodes or psychosis. So there's still a lot of groundwork to be done here as far as psilocybin's use in this, in this case. And then lastly, research suggests that guided, supervised psychedelic therapy sessions may enhance benefits and contribute to significant improvements in mental well-being. 
So there is a lot of work yet to be done, but you can't deny that even the fact that we've opened our eyes to look at previously shunned drugs in the treatment of stubborn and debilitating conditions is absolutely incredible. Other drugs in the same class as psilocybin include NN-dimethyltryptamine, which is DMT, mescaline, ketamine, LSD, and MDMA, or ecstasy, which was recently granted approval for its study in the ability to treat PTSD. To date, there's, I want to, I think there's 59 trials uh, registered with the FDA, and you can see them by going to clinicaltrials.gov and search for psilocybin. Therapeutic potential number two, neuroplasticity and brain connectivity. So studies suggest that psilocybin may enhance neuroplasticity or the brain's ability to reorganize itself and increase connectivity between different regions of the brain, which may contribute to changes in thought patterns and behaviors. Animal studies offer moderately strong evidence that psychedelics promote genes related to neuroplasticity, synapse strength, and dendrite growth, including brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. However, data in human studies has so far been inconclusive. So what does this potentially translate to? Possibly improved learning, cognitive flexibility, improved executive function and working memory. There's also research looking into the suggestion that at least some of the antidepressant effects from psilocybin may improve top-down control of the limbic system, which helps with impulse control and feelings of well-being in dementia where this is normally diminished. Therapeutic potential number three, chronic pain. In this category, I'm going to combine three different pain sources, migraines slash cluster headaches, cancer pain, and phantom limb pain. And before I get into the findings, I will preface this section with, this is all still being closely looked at. However, pain and how psychedelics play a role in its improvement is not fully understood and evidence of efficacy is fairly limited and not the greatest quality. It's not, it doesn't quite pass the crap test with flying colors. And for those of you who know what the crap test is, drop it in the comments. So the thinking here and how psilocybin may work to reduce pain is through activation of the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. Several neurophysiological responses occur that derail pathways in the brain associated with chronic pain. Then healthy reconnections can be newly established through the drug's neuroplastic effects, and this results in a sustained period of pain relief. So with cancer and palliative related pain, the analgesic effects of psychedelics were established a long time ago. I mean, a long time ago. And the current literature shows promising results in patients with cancer-related mental distress. In other areas, patients suffering from severe headaches who've been self-administering microdoses of psilocybin do report both acute pain relief as well as prevention of future pain. Phantom limb pain also has some really interesting research going on as noted in the study by Ramachandran et al., in which they use mirror visual feedback in combination with psilocybin and phantom massage in an amputee who at the end of the study found relief. I want to know what phantom massage is. Anybody knows, drop it in the comments, but I wrote this and I looked at it when I wrote it and I thought, I want to know what that is. And now just saying it again. I really want to know what phantom massage is. So anybody, anybody knows, let me know. Randomized control trials are now ongoing to study its effects in these circumstances. Furthermore, psychedelics have a generally favorable safety profile, especially when compared to other meds like opioids. And psychedelics don't have the high potential for addiction like opioids do as well. Therapeutic potential number four, anti-inflammatory. 
Studies have shown an association between inflammation and all chronic diseases, such as cancer and cardiovascular diseases, etc. But inflammation is a normal protective response to injury or infection, and it involves complex processes that normally limit tissue injury. However, in chronic inflammation, immune cells are dysregulated and tend to lose this self-limiting nature as a result. It's like they become toddlers, basically, and just run amok. And this is where damage occurs. Chronic exposure to pro-inflammatory cells leads to joint damage, nerve damage, cellular damage. Inflammatory cytokines are cell signaling protein molecules that are released during inflammation and introduce almost like a, a waterfall type effect that activates a chronic immune response. Some of these cytokines that you may have heard of before include tumor necrosis factor, interferons, and interleukins. And these all play a primary role in enhancing a cell's immune response. Results indicated that the extracts of psilocybin natalensis has potential antioxidant activities, which plays an important role in the oxidative stress that triggers inflammation. The results also indicated that these extracts are considered safe in the concentrations that they were used in the study. Which brings us to the next logical question. Questions. What is the safest way to take psilocybin? What are the potential side effects? And can you even obtain it legally? Which will kind of make the former two questions moot if the answer is no. So let's answer the last one first. As magic mushrooms go mainstream again, multiple U.S. states are pushing for decriminalization of psilocybin mushrooms. And in 2019, Denver, Colorado, and Oakland, California were the first cities to decriminalize, though not legalize. There is a difference. They, they were the first to decriminalize psilocybin, aka magic mushrooms. And then in 2020, Washington, D.C., of all places, voted to decriminalize a select few psychedelics, including mescaline and mushrooms. And then in 2020, Oregon became the first state to both legalize and decriminalize mushrooms for personal development, whatever that means, but yay, Oregon. And several other states are working on following suit. But despite these efforts, multiple cities and states in North America, especially, are still not quite riding the horse named decriminalization and most likely won't until changes take place in the federal regulatory framework and accessibility to federal funding. That said, recall that the FDA has previously slotted these magical misfits into a Schedule One rating, indicating that they're supposedly very dangerous and have no medical benefit makes it kind of challenging to figure out what's true and what's not, of course. So, I mean, the last part of it was has already been thoroughly established as not the case. But, but let's say, let's say you hypothetically had them appear in your hand. Hypothetically. How do you take them? Can you take too much? Hypothetically, yes. The median lethal dose, meaning the dose that would kill around half of the test population, equates to 280 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, which, interesting side note, is one and a half times greater than that of caffeine. So translation, you would need to eat almost 40 pounds of magic mushrooms to reach a, an even remotely lethal dose, which is great news, 40 pounds. Anyway, only a few cases of death have ever been recorded in association with magic mushrooms, and in those cases, it was also possible to rule out underlying causes that might have contributed or been the real issue at play. The biggest risk with psychedelics is the risk of something called serotonin syndrome, which is when an excessive amount and accumulation of serotonin floods the body and Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that plays a crucial role in regulating mood, appetite, and sleep, among other functions. Normally, the body maintains a balance of it, but 
certain medications or drug combinations can disrupt this balance, and this is one of them. So this can happen when someone consumes a drug like psilocybin in combination with antidepressants, and the symptoms include agitation, confusion, rapid heart rate, dilated pupils, elevated blood pressure, muscle twitching or stiffness, shivering and sweating, headaches, and very, very high fever. And in severe cases, serotonin syndrome can lead to seizures, unconsciousness, and ultimately death. So treatment consists of administration of sedatives or medications to block serotonin production. This is an emergency and can sometimes even require endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation, external cooling of the body if the temperature is really super elevated, and intravenous administration of antihypertensives if the blood pressure is very high. A drug called cryptoheptadine may be considered for refractory cases. As in most situations, the dose directly equates to the side effects. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the most common potential issue, which is a bad trip. And this can mean severe panic attacks or dangerous and risky behaviors, which ultimately can lead to injury to the person taking them or collateral damage to others in one way or another. Good trips can usher in mental and emotional healing and in contrast, bad trips can leave a wake of destruction and have long lasting impact when not used under the supervision of a licensed professional, especially if substances are combined with it like alcohol or MDMA. People can also have very disconcerting flashbacks after psilocybin is even out of their system. Powered flashback sound. Ultimately, tolerance does occur over time with frequent use, but most users don't develop a physical addiction to it. So, which is the good news. I'm not a huge proponent of illegal or unsupervised use of any substance that has the potential to cause harm. However, these types of substances specifically have been used for thousands and thousands of years. And it creates a lot of cognitive dissonance for me when I think of the fact that we need to push the boundaries of what we know about these compounds. But at the same time, I can't help but wonder why there was such a strong resistance on the part of legal authorities when it came to psilocybin. I mean, I can guess and my mind runs rampant with theories, but I mean, that's all they are for the time being. What's exciting is we seem to be moving in the right direction as psilocybin-assisted cognitive therapy is a growing industry, and I feel it's emerging from the dark stereotype that has shackled it for years. The increasing rate of global mood and anxiety disorders, particularly depression, combined with the growing culture and governmental acceptance and the increasing number of published scientific articles and the push for decriminalization has the psychedelic industry experiencing a massive economic value increase. And this is probably due to the renewed pharmaceutical interest. Globally, this therapeutic market is predicted to reach a valuation of $6.8 billion by 2027. And currently, Psilocybin is the most studied psychedelic in the world. Ketamine is close behind though, and it's fascinating. It's called the master molecule for a good reason. So lots of reasons I'd watch this next. That's going to do it. Thanks for hanging out with me. I'm Danielle Minetti, and this has been Lucid Med. I will ask you to hit like, subscribe, share, do all the stuff, do all the things. It all helps the channel. You can also play a huge role in helping me reach people around the world who might be looking for this information, but YouTube hasn't quite locked in on our audience yet. They're, they're getting better. They're, it's improving. We still need a little help. So I can help. Power of this audience has been demonstrated on a few of my videos now, and it never fails to astound me. 
just how instrumental you've all been in this. Sharing your experiences in the comments and pushing certain topics to the top of the list just by your interaction with it alone. So thank you. And I will see you over here.